hi there, and welcome to StoryStream, the Vancouver Public Library's Storytime for Adults. My name is Jana, and today I'm coming to you from the Yosef Wask Poets' Corner, up on level nine of the Central Library. The Central Library, like all 21 of our locations, is located on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil peoples. To find out more about the people who have lived here since time immemorial, and VPL's commitment to truth and reconciliation, please visit our website. Samuel Taylor Coleridge said, poetry is the best words in the best order. And here at the library, we've got everything you need to start putting pencil to paper to pen your next best poem. You can explore our physical poetry collections by heading to the call number 821 or by talking to any information staff member who will find you anything you need to know about the lives of poets and their works. You can research poets and poetry using our online resources and guides like the Gale Literary Index, which is a master index that combines and cross-references over 165,000 author names, including variants and pseudonyms, for over 215,000 titles. But that's not all, folks. At the library, you can experience poetry by attending one of our many events, which highlight and celebrate local authors reading their own works. And finally, you can engage with the city's own poet laureate through workshops available on our YouTube channel and in person. The Poet Laureate, also known as the People's Poet, is an honorary position with a flexible term of two to three years that is funded by a generous endowment established by Dr. Yosef Wask in 2006. During their term, the Laureate will act as a champion for poetry, language, and the arts and create a unique literary project and represent the city as Laureate during readings and at civic functions and public poetry events. Past poets include Christy Charles, Rachel Rose, Evelyn Lau, and many more. We're lucky enough today to be joined by Vancouver's current Poet Laureate, Fiona Tinway Lamb. In her role as Poet Laureate, Fiona works with the library and the city of Vancouver to promote poetry to the people. She has developed and delivered a multitude of engaging workshops and competitions for folks to learn and live the poetry life. Most recently, Fiona launched the Writing the City Video Poem Contest, in which students from selected film programs at local colleges and universities compete to win the title and the cash prize. The poems are based on an earlier stage of the contest, where folks in Vancouver were encouraged to write a poem about a place in our beautiful city. We had over 250 entries, and 27 were shortlisted with winners in the categories of youth, emerging, and established poets. You can view the evolution of the contest on our YouTube channel and visit Fiona's website to hear audio recordings of the shortlisted and winning poems. Fiona Tenway Lamb's work also appears in over 40 anthologies, including Best Canadian Poetry. Her work has won the New Quarterly's Nick Blatchford Prize and has been shortlisted for the City of Vancouver's Book Award. She has thrice been selected for BC's Poetry in Transit. Her award-winning poetry videos are done in collaboration with filmmakers and have screened at festivals locally and internationally. A former lawyer, Fiona obtained an MFA in creative writing from UBC and presently teaches at SFU Continuing Studies. Stick around after Fiona's reading to watch one of her poetry videos. Today, Fiona will be reading three poems from each of her three published books. Enjoy! So the library has been a very special place for me since I was a young kid. My mom would take me and my sister to the library at the Oak Ridge branch when we were kids. And I distinctly remember spending a lot of time browsing the shelves of the children's section and just plucking paperbacks, autobiographies, comic books, anything 
whatever interested me and sitting with a big pile and going through and choosing which ones I would eventually take out and take home to read. And I think that was the a high point of my week, every week. I'm going to be reading three poems from each of my three poetry books today. And I thought I'd start with three poems from Intimate Distances, which is my debut book when I just graduated from my Master's of Fine Arts program at uh, UBC. And one of the poems that I wrote was about my childhood experience going to Chinese school after school. So an extra layer of school. Learning Chinese. After English school, we took the bus three days a week to a church basement and a teacher who looked like Chairman Mao with a perm. Dreaming of TV, we sat at tables with our textbooks open to rhymes about cows and sheep going up mountains, the shepherds who looked after them, good students who arrived early to school while mothers made meals and fathers worked. Each lesson, the teacher conducted our choir of fingers, new words poked, brushed, and sliced into the air. The three drops of water, flat lines like ladder rungs, lines straight down with slight flicks to the left, or tapered tails swept in or out. We learned how a mouth is a square with a hollow inside. Two trees make a forest. The sun and the moon side by side can be as bright as a mind. Peace is a woman under the roof of a home. How we stand in the center of both fire and sky. So those are very vivid memories I had of uh, going to school after school. Um, one thing about writing poetry is you look back on your life and certain experiences and incidents that really stand out. And there was one incident that really stood out to me, and that was when my mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, and we visited the neurologist. Maternal archaeology. In the neurologist's examining room, I helped my mother undress. Like a punished child, she sits hunched on the high table while I lift off each layer gently. Blue jacket bought on sale at Zeller's. Woolen vest grandma sent one Christmas. My checked blouse from high school. One of dad's frayed undershirts. Then the flesh, withered and soft as an old quilt. Fine skin loose around a body becoming unfamiliar to itself. I draped the paper robe out between us like a curtain. Docile, her arms slide into the sleeves. I tie the back and stand away to see if everything's right. She points to what's on her foot, the word for sock gone missing. I do write funny poems too. And this is a funny poem about a cross-cultural relationship that went awry and ended. And this isn't to say that all cross-cultural relationships are doomed, but this particular one was. But it's funny, I miss my former mother-in-law more than I miss my former partner, I confess. Um, I hope he doesn't hear this. Legacy. Each summer, your mother's hands transformed heap bowls of ripe fruit into glistening fillings. Her deft persuasion of dough into pastry through the white silted air. Rhubarb, blueberry, peach, apple, desserts for a year's worth of holidays. I tried to make pie the way I tried to be your wife. Four Pyrex pie plates, a battle to bind flour, fat, and water into elusive tenderness. You gave me a yearning for homemade pie that lingered longer than love, then left with the pie plates. And what you learnt, congee breakfasts, the intricate textures of dim sum, how to eat shark's fin with a spoonful of vinegar, never to forgo the good luck of red bean soup, and always to rest your chopsticks parallel across the bowl at a meal's end. So a lot of my poems have food in them. Um, I no longer eat shark's fin because shark's fin, of course, is uh, very politically incorrect and hurts the poor sharks who have done nothing wrong. Um, but uh, it definitely 
uh, is something that we used to eat at banquets and so forth. So my second book is Enter the Chrysanthemum, and it's funny with poetry books. You can go chronologically or you end up looping, and that's what I've done in time because there are certain things as I grow older that I remember that I didn't remember when I was younger. Um, but one of the poems that I wrote was about regret. I think we all live with the experience of regret about something. And going back to my childhood, there's a wealth of stories that we all have about our childhoods. Um, I remembered when my dad had his last visit to our home, and I didn't realize it was going to be his last visit from the hospital to our home. And I have a lot of regret about it still. Anyways, it's a poem about an experience and how I dealt with regret. Offering. Kneeling by his grave, I offer my father a cup of tea, the way he'd wanted it before he died. I was 11 when the rented wheelchair came. I plowed long furrows into the carpets. He was home after months in hospital. Ringed by family, he asked for lemon tea, a bit of sugar, not too hot. Assigned the task, I went to the kitchen, filled a mug with lukewarm water, squeezed a tea bag against the side to tint the water, a splash of lemon from an ancient bottle, sugar, not enough, a precarious march back to his bedside. He sipped it and winced. Good, he said, though it wasn't. Fell back to the pillow. Christmas Eve, he was wheeled out for company. My mother, a red-eyed bullet through the thrumming house. Amid the clink of teacups, he lay on the couch, filmed with the sweat from the toll of being alive. Quiet and cool in my room, I sat alone with a box of Swiss chocolate, miniatures in neat white cubicles. The waxy sweetness of the milk and white bars, a prim smothering. The nuts were grit on my teeth and tongue. Only the bitter one tasted of something I could have felt. Today, at last, I've done it right. A good pour of amber honey, fresh lemon, boiling water, loose leaves. Tea brewed hot and strong. Drink, my father, as I drink to you, the striving of sun, sky, earth, and flesh held within these porcelain cups. And we still visit my dad's grave a couple times a year, and my mother's as well. So the other poem I thought I'd read um, is another poem about an end of a relationship. Don't worry, I haven't had too many relationships, just a few. Um, and this one is about that sense of family that you know is also going to be disrupted when a relationship ends. Um, and... Uh, just to make it clear, it's me, uh, former partner, and my baby in the shower. Shower. Those mornings we're together, the three of us stand in a spray of soft diamonds, sunlight through glass and everything sparkling. You hold our son high in your arms while I lather him up. Our little otter, he's as sleek and slick as when he slid from my womb. Then I lather you, foot to thigh, chest to back, the heft and sinew of what I have loved. You and he both turn in the warm rain, my universe of king and prince rinse to a glisten. When you soap my skin, I live, become brief silk in your hands, as luscious as when your desire flowed. Only water will love me when you are gone. So... Um, the other thing about relationships is, uh, of course, the parent and child relationship. And this one touches upon my own kind of way of looking at the world, which is kind of uh, pessimistic, I admit. And um, my kids, who at the time had a very different way of viewing the world and probably a better way of viewing the world, which helped me uh, in understanding how to enjoy the moment. Omelette. I told you there'd be food in these poems, so this is another food poem. First, the egg. I teach him the way I taught myself, 
food group by food group through the tattered cookbook. I break the eggs, he stirs them, a flick of salt, a few drops of cream. I heat the pan, grate the cheese, he pours the eggs in. Opacity spreads from the edges inward, and ocean sizzles into land. Perched on the countertop, he observes me like the scientist he might become. I flip one side over, voila. Last night we played a game and pulled a card. What would the world come to in a hundred years? I feared a polluted war zone unless humankind changed. He said we'd live on Mars. I pour the claret tea as fragrant as a berry patch into the good cups. Warming his hands, he wiggles his fingers through the prospect of clouds. He stirs in the honey, licks the spoon, says, thank you, bees. White cyclamen on the table, blaze of winter sun through trees, a plate of simple food. Beside us, the ones we love. So those are three poems from this book. And then we're on to the third book, Odes and Laments. And this book was inspired by Pablo Neruda. He wrote many odes to ordinary things that um, could include socks, artichokes, tables, guitars, french fries, that kind of thing. And so I started writing odes to ordinary things myself. But I also realized that I had a lot of laments, and some of those laments are actually odes, too, for things that we've lost. So going back to childhood, I remembered this lesson I had from my grandfather about how to use chopsticks. And he was a very, very stern, critical guy who very rarely cracked a smile. He wore this gray suit and this very kind of dour expression with um, kind of a, a sour puss look on his face, like everything we were doing was wrong, not to say that we weren't doing everything wrong. Um, and whenever he came to visit from Hong Kong, we all had to dress up and we had to be super polite and follow his dictates. So when he tried to teach us how to use chopsticks, uh, it was something we took very seriously. Chopsticks. Grandfather sets down the bowl full of marbles. I pick up the chopsticks and hover, then picture my hand as a heron with a long, long beak plunging down to pluck each orb, lift it through air and held breath in a tremulous trip toward the saucer. Five thousand years of evolution in hand, branches honed to stir ancient cauldrons, become sleek batons of ivory, gold, or jade, adorning an aristocrat's table. With their deft dance and dip, more adroit than a fork, twin acrobats poised to hoist choice morsels. Let your elders lead, he tells me. Never point your chopsticks at a guest. Never spear your food like a fisherman. Don't tap the side of your bowl like a beggar. Keep them by the plate when you rest or across the bowl at meal's end, but never upright like incense burning in an urn for the dead. While he watches, stiff bamboo grows nimble. One by one, each small glassy planet arcs up, then lands with a clink. The bowl gleams empty. Grandfather nods. And he taught uh, my father and my uncle that way, too. They have distinct memories of uh, being taught in the same manner. So I'm going to read another food poem. And it's about the raspberry canes in my backyard and a relationship. And it's not about the end of a relationship, but the beginning of a relationship that is still continuing. August Raspberries. Plucked, all those little mouths mirror our thirst for the season's nectar. Deep crimson bounty enveloped by cream clouds or suspended in glowing realms of jam. I woo you with the first sweet bowl heaped with sun-warmed nubbins under ice cream mounds. Tangy velvet cushions against teeth and tongue, our mouths royal. 
Last handfuls of summer tang hang low. What will remain when branches are bare? So the last poem I'm going to read is a poem about food again, apples, or more precisely apple juice. And it's inspired by those old orchards that make heritage apple juice and apple cider. And there are fewer of them now, unfortunately. But it's also a poem about nature, celebrating community, and celebrating poetry. Libation. For me, no wine. Just the life's blood of apples mashed whole in a democracy of pulp. Skin, core, seeds, flesh, warty or warped, bruised or scabbed, joined to make juice as round and real as earth. Let's open our tongues to bitter soil, sweet scorch of sun, crisp of autumn leaves, shimmer of river. Forget those tortured espalier trees, slaves chained to their stakes, forced to sing their single notes. Give us the old orchard's choir of venerable trees, gnarled arms held wide and high as tapers. Quaff the murky golden madrigals of juice and no, all revealed in a moment's swallow. For what is juice but poetry? What we've lived and known, wrung out of roots, trunk, guts, limbs, into the radiant fruit of now, seasoned by wind and night. What's held within this cup, this poem, this juice, I offer you. I want to add that some of these poems can be seen on my website, fionalam.net, and some of them have been turned into poetry videos. So if you're not into poetry, I'm sure you'll be into poetry videos. There are visuals and animations that go along with many of the poems. One of the, the biggest honors and pleasures for me is to know that I've written books that are actually on the shelves of the library. Who would have ever imagined that? I certainly wouldn't have imagined that as a kid. So you can find copies of all three of these poetry books um, on the shelves at the library. And I also edited a book of poetry of Canadian poems about facing cancer by other Canadian poets. And that's probably the book I'm the most proud of, actually, more than my own poems, is because there are uh, poems by Laura Crozier and uh, Maureen Hines, Elise Partridge, Miranda Pearson, Anne Simpson, poets across the country, some of who are still alive and some, unfortunately, who have passed. But it gives a, a window into the experience of those who experience cancer in distilled short uh, poems that uh, are very meaningful. And it goes through the diagnosis stage to the coming through chemotherapy stage and celebrating being alive stage. The other book I'm really proud of, probably number two <laughs> of being proud about, is uh, my kid's book, The Rainbow Rocket. It's based on my son's relationship with my mother, his grandmother, as she experienced cognitive decline. And in reality, they had a very short time together. So in the book, I could create a longer relationship, make him older, make my mother younger, and have them do things together, which they didn't get a chance to do. And it also celebrates Qingming Day, which is April 5th every year, where um, families go to the grave sites and pay homage and um, pay respects to the dead. And uh, I love the pictures by Christy Bridgman in it. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's copies of that in the library too. And the other book that's in the library is Love Me True. And it's an anthology that I co-edited with Jane Silcott about the ups, downs, ins, and outs of marriage. So about partners who pass away, about divorce, about affairs, about mental illness, um, about same-sex marriages, about polyamory, um, you name it. There are poems and nonfiction about 
this experience of relationships that we all have. And I have a piece in it as well, but um, I find it more fun to read about other people's experiences. So I think there's a book club set as well at the library. Lyrical pricklings, murmurs, susurrations, whirs, intermittent image imp, flashes, dreams, star stutter, coruscating crumbs, effervescent cacophonous things shimmering, Cortical canticle cascade. Start. Start to write a poem. <laughs> 